Hey everyone, how's it going? I hope you're all doing great and following the three H's of the channel. In this video, it's all about Canada, specifically Nova Scotia. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, pull up a stump and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. So this is my first time ever talking about this. I have a story to share and I don't know who else would possibly believe me. This is not one of those creepy pastas either. This happened to me in August of 2017, but I've only really started to come to terms with it now, and I'm ready to talk about it, I think. And this isn't something that you can just talk to a therapist about. I'll try to get all the details together as much as I can, but again, this was a traumatic thing that I haven't gotten over, and it's the first time telling this story to anyone, and you're all strangers. So just try to bear with me if I get a little into the details or get long winded. But basically, the other day I started reading about skinwalkers or flesh gates, as some people call them. And I'm 99% sure now that I've encountered one of those things. They are real. I tried as hard as I can to push that memory to the back of my head and just repress it. But after stumbling upon the realization that there seem to be a lot of stories that share similarities with mine, it's clear that I can't do that. So here it goes. A little bit of background to start off. I live in small town Nova Scotia, Canada, and I was always a bit of a troublemaker as a kid. But I've really smartened up in the past year or so due to the birth of my son. As of a couple of months after this happened, I actually became a person who prays. And goes to church. I'm 25 now and he was born when me and my girlfriend were only 17. My girlfriend Emma was raised on a farm and is pretty rugged and outdoorsy. My best friend Ben is a good kid. He's small and kind of androgynous looking. He's a weird guy that likes electronic music with no lyrics or something like that. He doesn't even drink or smoke weed because it gives him anxiety. We honestly don't have much in common, and I'm not really sure how we became friends. But I do know what holds our relationship together is a really strong understanding and acceptance of one another. We have the type of relationship where you share everything without asking, without judgment. Whenever I got into a fight with my parents and got kicked out, I needed a place to stay, and his door and arms were wide open. And then for the past couple of years, We've gone on a camping trip together in the summer. I would take him and our girlfriends to this secluded beach about three hours away. It's a half a kilometer stretch of sand in the middle of nowhere, basically. It's nestled between forested cliffside with nothing but huge rocks for miles on the other side. The access road isn't even paved. It's long and winding and bumpy, but it's gorgeous how the trees hang down in a sort of a tunnel around you. Like little country houses are dotting the landscapes as well. Some of them are quaint and pretty and well maintained, while others are dilapidated, abandoned old shacks. Eventually, you come to a bend where the houses stop, the woods get thicker, and the road steeps upward. Then, when you get to the top, there's a clearing and you can see over the cliff to one of the most beautiful scenic beaches you could ever imagine. It's actually enchanting to see. The beach itself is a public beach, so you aren't technically allowed to camp there, but it's just the kind of place where most of the locals are not really going to care, and even if they did, the cops aren't going to care enough to drive all the way out there at night to shoo away some teenagers off the beach, so we felt pretty comfortable. We had been there twice before, as I mentioned. Both times, a few small groups of people came and went throughout the day, but by nighttime, and then when we woke up in the morning, we had the whole beach to ourselves. This year, we upgraded to a much bigger, more luxurious tent because we were bringing my baby, and planned to set up his playpen inside the tent to substitute a crib. So anyway, so again, at the time I was a proud new father and an owner of a 2008 Ford Escape SUV. The car is much more cramped this year due to the baby. It's me, my girlfriend, our son, Ben, and his girlfriend Jocelyn, and my two dogs, 
jammed in the back with all of our stuff. It's not really relevant yet, but it will be, so let me just tell you quickly about my dogs. They're two pit bulls, Nebraska and California. Nebraska, I got when I was 10 and raised him from just a little puppy. Now he's a big lap dog. Callie is a guard dog. She can be a mean bitch when she wants to be, and that's why I love her. We adopted her when I was 14, and she was just about 8 months old then. Her previous owners had wanted a guard dog, but were having trouble reining her in, and the wife was concerned about her child's safety. Given that I didn't have one yet, I thought that the perfect time to train a badass protector dog was then. And by that point, she was already pretty deep into training, and seemed to take pretty well to me in Nebraska. When Emma got pregnant, I was worried that I might have to give her up too, because we didn't know how she'd react to a child in the house. But when he was born, the first day we brought him home, she just instantly fell so in love with that baby. She stopped sleeping at the foot of our bed with Nebraska that night and just started sleeping under his crib. I think she knows what her role in the family is and is genuinely happy to be that for our son as her top priority. So, continue. I park at the end of the road where it loops in a small circle and we head down to the path to the beach. We were carrying as much as we could but leaving plenty behind still. We set up our camp where the sand turns into a patchy grass. This is about a 50 to 100 feet in front of the tree line. Everyone has their assignments. Emma begins staking the tent. Ben starts making a fire pit. Jocelyn plays with the baby so he doesn't try to eat rocks and I make a couple more trips back and forth to the car for the rest of our things. I trip in the sand and eat shit on the way back with the cooler, but luckily nobody seen me do that. So we all finish setting up and we crack open a few cold ones. I drink with Emma and intermittently I smoke a joint with Jocelyn for a few hours. The sun starts to go down. Ben starts the fire. Despite Emma being outdoorsy for our group, Ben is randomly pretty adept at managing a fire pit and building one. The beach is now completely empty except for our camp and a group of 20-somethings on the far side of the beach. They're also sitting around a campfire. They're progressively getting louder and rowdier. Eventually, my kid starts crying, so we put him to bed in our tent. And not too long after that, the group of other people starts to slowly clear off the beach. I go behind the tent to take a pee. It's about 11 p.m. by this point. Their fire is burning lower than ours, but you can still make out three silhouettes around it. They have no tent, but it looks like they're putting down sleeping bags in the sand. You can see pretty well in the dark here, because even though it had gotten kind of cloudy, the stars and moon are so bright and shine so brightly that they illuminate the clouds, which then reflects off the water and lights up the sand. I round the tent back to my seat, and I can see one of them gets up and begins the trek toward the path up off the beach. Most of his friends had already taken that path, but as he gets closer, it's clear that he's coming directly toward us. Nebraska, being the big dumb sook that she is, charges to close the distance between us and them. Luckily, this guy seemed to be at least somewhat familiar with dogs, because he didn't put up his guard to protect himself. He knew the huge pit bull bearing down on him wasn't going to attack. He pets my dog and continues into our campsite, smiling and waving, apparently drunk or something by himself. Hey guys, he announced. I figured I should come over and meet our neighbors for the night. How's it going? Ben snaps a shh at him. He says there's a baby asleep in the tent. And he says, oh shit, sorry. It's all good, I reply. I extend my hand to shake his. I'm more drunk than Emma and more stoned than Jocelyn, so even though we come here specifically to avoid contact with other campers, I was feeling friendly. I told him my name. I point out my friends and introduce them, and he introduces himself as Ducky. He says that he and his friends are getting tired, but he's not, so he came over to meet us. He asks if we're from around here. I tell him, kind of, but not really. He says that he just lives down at the base of the road where we drove up on. He camps here all the time, ever since he was a little kid. And suddenly, my phone rings. 
The phone call was weird for a couple of reasons, but at the time, in my messed up head, they seemed to cancel each other out, and I didn't think anything of it at the time. For starters, there's no cell reception on that beach. Literally, as you drive up on the road to get here, you lose service. And then after that, it's almost like you step into some kind of electronic disabling force field or something. As soon as your feet hit the sand, you lose that last bar. Occasionally, it comes back for just a minute or so, and if you caught it right, you could check your Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but we don't come camping to watch our phone. So, surprised that anyone would be calling me, I answer, and this is when the whole night starts to get actually weird. I say hello, but there's nothing on the other end, just silence, followed by a short burst of static, and then my service cuts back out, and I lose the call. I assume at the time that I couldn't hear anything because there just wasn't enough reception, which makes perfect sense. But looking back now, I swear, in that burst of static, I think I heard a baby crying. I have no way to know for sure, though, or if that's just me going crazy thinking about how screwed up this all gets. But again, at the time, the phone call didn't totally trigger any mental alarms. Oh, and also, after putting the baby to bed, every 20 or 25 minutes or so, Callie would start whining at the door, so we'd let her in, and then she'd just want back out again. So after she did that, three times, we just left the bottom of the tent unzipped, so she could poke her head in and check on the baby, which seemed to satisfy her. But at this point in the night, after repocketing my phone, I hear Nebraska start growling. Nebraska doesn't growl at strangers. He doesn't growl at Cowley. He doesn't growl, period, really, ever. I literally don't think I've heard him growl since he was a puppy. He's a total pussycat. He actually got quite a bit of size on Cowley, but Cowley picks on him relentlessly until he would climb up onto my lap. This was absolutely not like my dog to be aggressive like this. Now, I do start feeling like something is off, and that's when it hits me, that putrid smell. The air smells like fish normally there, which isn't super pleasant to begin with, but you do adjust quickly because it's so clear and fresh otherwise. This was like if the entire bay's supply of fish had suddenly all went belly up at the same time, and the unmistakable stench of death had just rolled in off the water, smacking us all in the face and continuing on its way up into the woods. Nebraska is inching away from our camp toward the woods, still growling. He's fixated on something at the tree line. It must be a deer or something. I hope. I hope it's not a bear. It's hard to make out through the brush, but I think I can see two little red lights, like the flashing of your phone when its battery is critical, but unblinking, watching. Nebraska then lets out what I can only describe as a war cry, because I've never heard him bark like that before, and then he darts off, running into the woods. Now I'm not so much creeped out by this, as I am annoyed as hell, that I have to wander around in the woods, potentially all night, looking for my dog, but I do love him and I have no intention of just leaving him behind, and I'm really worried and sad about the possibility of it coming to that. I yell out, Nebraska, but he disappears from sight. I say, Nebraska, get back here, but to no avail. He don't usually take off like that, does he? Dougie correctly assumed that we would not bring him here if he was a flight risk. I say, no, that's really unlike him. I was scanning around for Callie while we were focused on Nebraska. She had disappeared, some guard dog I thought, but it turns out she had just quietly slunk into the tent and was resting by the baby's playpen. I say, good girl Callie, stay. I toss her a graham cracker and zip the tent all the way up behind me. Dougie says that he has an old 22 hunting rifle in his trunk and offers to go get it to help me look for Nebraska in case we encounter critters. At this point, I remember that I have a handgun of my own in a car. It's one of those semi-automatic CO2 revolvers, 
one of those ones that's classified somewhere between an airsoft and a real pistol. It's definitely not lethal. You'd have to pretty much fire it at point blank at something's head. But of course, that's more than dangerous enough to drop the orange tip that you have on toy guns. What's more, it should be loaded with hunting pallets. I had bought the thing impulsively a couple years back and pretty much only ever used it to shoot cans with my ex. Then I stashed it under my seat in the car and forgot about it for two years. I was quite pleased with this revelation because it meant that I could take the hatchet into the woods and still leave the campsite with some form of weapon. I informed Dougie, hand him my car keys to retrieve it, trusting this stranger not to steal my car. After a few minutes, Dougie returns. He hands me my pistol and keys. The gun is dirty and, like, sticky from being neglected, but we have baby wipes. I clean it off and decide that we should probably make sure it still works. There are eight pellets in a ten-round chamber, I think. It could be worse. I have Emma watch what I'm doing as I remove the safety and cock the hammer. I aim at the woods and pull the trigger. It seems to work fine. As I realize that we're about to go off into the woods with weapons, I get this sense of dread. I hand Emma my gun. I go back into the tent and tell my son that I love them in case I die. The baby is fast asleep, but the dog is wide awake. I exit the tent, pick up the hatchet off the ground. Ben is holding the barbecue pitchfork nervously. He says he intends to use it as a weapon. I tell them, if anything starts coming out of those woods... Don't try to be a hero. Send Callie to it. It could just be Nebraska coming back. And if it's not, well, she'll give you time to grab the baby and get away. If we're not back in 90 minutes, just go. I mean it. Take the baby and get the hell out of here. Emma is not happy about this idea. I give Jocelyn my keys anyways. And I assure her that I can always just pack our stuff up with Dougie and get a ride out of here with him later. So Dougie and I finally head into the woods. It's honestly nothing spooky for about an hour, but there's no sign of the dog. I'm disappointed that we couldn't find him, but part of me still hopes that he just may have made his way back while we were looking for him. He hadn't exactly been gone that long after all. We decide to head back before the others get worried and leave without me because I was freaking out and told them to. So, then we hear a rustle in the bushes. I call out, Nebraska? Dougie aims his gun, steady in the direction of the sound. And then there's another rustle in the bushes from the opposite direction. Dougie spins around again. I'm getting a little spooked now. I say, let's, uh, let's just go. And then there's another sound, way off in the distance, much deeper into the woods. It's a human baby crying. In fact, it sounds exactly like my baby. I'm frozen. You hear that? Ducky gulps. Yeah, I do. I'm very tempted to follow it. My mind races with thoughts of a bear or a pack of wolves ambushing our camp and hauling my son off into the night. But I don't think they would have gotten that far ahead of us without us hearing him cry before now even if he survives such a thing. We turn around and just get out of there, but I am deeply disturbed. I need to get back now. I need to know that everything is okay. We break through the tree line, and there's Nebraska. He's sniffing around behind the tent like he's going to pee on it. Callie must still be inside. The others don't seem to have noticed that he came back. I say, hey, stupid dog, what the hell was that all about? I'm so relieved that I forget all about the spooky baby crying. That or I convinced myself that it was coming from one of the country houses and I was just imagining that it sounded exactly like my kid or something. I don't know. But in that moment, I can tell you I didn't care. I was just happy to see Nebraska and the others all in one place. I sat down back in the sand trying to relax. Jocelyn drifted in and out of sleep on Ben's lap while he and Emma chatted with Dougie in Nebraska, just sat there, staring at the fire like an idiot. I take a puff off a joint, and then I remember the spooky baby crying. And I say, um, 
I think maybe we should just probably go home. Emma and Ben press me, but I don't give them a straight answer. I just keep saying I don't feel good anymore, and all that sketchy shit. I don't mention that I'm still kind of drunk, but honestly, I was just so uncomfortable that my own level of alertness was literally the least of my concerns. Sticking around to find out whatever the hell that was in the woods, that there was a real risk here. Ben knows me so well that I think he pieced together that something in the woods must have shook me, that I was serious, so he gave in and backed me up, eventually agreeing that we should go. I'm not quite spooked enough yet to just leave all of our stuff behind, so we start cleaning up. As soon as Emma opens the tent door, Callie lunges out of it. It was like she was a mountain lion or something. She actually pounced on Nebraska, knocking Emma aside like she didn't even see her in the way. And it was brutal. See, there are guard dogs, and then there are attack dogs. Guard dogs are protective, loyal, and disciplined. Attack dogs are barely contained, vicious. And what Callie did was a vicious attack. She went right for the jugular. I think she got it too, because he started spurting blood from his neck. And then there's a lot of yelping and snarling for like half a minute. Everyone is horrified, especially Emma. She screams and cries, retreats into the tent. The baby is waking up and joining her as he lets me know that he's okay, that Callie didn't hurt him. Not that it even occurred to me in the first place that she might have. At this point, I have no idea what the hell's going on, and I reach for my gun that Emma left on the ground. Nebraska's bleeding bad and frantically fending off Callie. They're rolling around in the sand, and it's just becoming stained red. For a second, he manages to get the upper hand and pushes her off, staggering them both. Callie almost knocks the tent over, but doesn't miss a beat. She jumps up and tackles Nebraska right into the fire. She leaps out from on top of him, almost gracefully, but doesn't stick the landing. It was probably for the best though. Her underside had caught fire just a bit and the thudding into the sand put it out quickly. This is the part of the story where shit changes to defy any rational explanation. Even now, I'm kind of shaking just writing it. This is when we realize that whatever this thing is, is not Nebraska. It becomes very apparent that this is clearly not my dog. It stands up on its hind legs, lets out this unholy effing screeching. It's a wail that I swear was so loud you could have heard it all the way across the bay in New Brunswick. It's engulfed in flames and its back is turned to us so it's facing Cali, but I can tell that its shoulders have also been pulled back almost into a more human-like position. And then there's two gunshots. Between that thing screaming and now Dougie popping off gunshots two feet away from my head, my ears are ringing now, and I can't tell if it's screaming or what, but I saw its head cocked to the side when the bullet connected. I don't know how many more shots he fired, but I closed my eyes and emptied my clip as well, save one pellet, into that thing. And when I opened my eyes, it was running back into the woods on its hind legs, still very much on fire. We were all expecting the foliage to start going up in flames as well, but the light quickly disappeared into the darkness. I see all the commotion woke up Dougie's buddies, and they're running toward us. You should get out of here. We won't be far behind, he said as he jogged over to meet them. I tell everyone to grab whatever they can fit in their hands. We can always get another cooler and a tent, but we're going to get the entire F out of here right now. I say this loudly, partly because I'm trying to take charge, and mostly because I'm half deafened. We made our way up the path to the car, and there's Nebraska again. Emma had regained her composure by now, because she never actually saw the worst of it, but I could tell this upset her, that she was trying very hard not to break down again. He's crying, and desperately scratching at the door. Like I have been teasing him with, you want to go for a car ride? For an hour or more, and he just couldn't take the anticipation anymore. I dropped my shit and pulled out my gun. 
There's only one pallet left, and after what I just saw, I'm 100% ready to decapitate my dog the second he looks at me funny. But the thing is, he doesn't. I call his name, and he looks at me. I don't want to say that everything felt right, because so much was already incomprehensibly wrong. But when he looked at me, he didn't look at me wrong. He looked at me with those big, dumb, beady pit bull eyes, and I knew that this time, it was actually my dog. And right on cue, as if to confirm it, Callie walked up to him and looked behind his ear, like she always does after she's hurt him and he doesn't want to play anymore. Upon closer inspection, he has a gnarly scar over his eye, and his entire right side is just scratched and ripped to shreds. I think, well, it's nothing that stitches and antibiotics won't fix, but it looks like he was hurt really badly. Still, he doesn't seem overly bothered by it, just happy to see us and eager to get into the car. And I think, oh, me too, buddy. I let the dogs in the back, I strap the baby in, and we peel out of there, breathing a collective sigh of relief. And then, in the rearview mirror, some large creature is trailing us. It's running like an upright gorilla with its hand still on the ground, as if it's pacing itself to keep a certain distance. All that dread comes back, and then it's just gone. But that doesn't make me feel any better at all because all the trees around us are shaking violently, sometimes even slightly ahead of us, but sticking to either side of the road, like it was actually leaping over the car from tree to tree without ever actually appearing in sight. I'm pretty much sober at this point, and doing 90 on a road you really shouldn't go for 30 on. Everyone's crying. We clear the dense part of the woods and get to the part where there are houses, and the thing starts to back off. Not all at once, but shortly thereafter. The rustling stopped in the air, just felt less tense. We seem to have lost the thing. We hit the end of the street, and make a left turn onto the main road, back towards the highway home. There's someone just standing in the middle of the road. My headlights shine right into his eyes, but he doesn't blink. He just stood there, with this absolutely nightmare fueled twisted smile that I'll never forget. It looks like Dougie. Of course it is. And now we're playing chicken. There's no possible way that he could have gotten so far ahead of us without passing us in his own car. Basically, I'm fresh out of nope, and I make an executive decision. I put the pedal to the metal. Emma says, oh god, no, what the F. I hit this unholy entity with my car and don't look back, but Ben does. He stops and pauses. He says there's nothing there. It's like it just disappeared. But I'm definitely worried that this thing is hanging on underneath the car, but I keep that to myself. I feel like that everybody's thinking it too anyways. I just keep driving. We make it to the highway, and about 40 minutes out, we see a well-lit parking lot just off of an exit ramp. It's a truck stop and a McDonald's. Both of them are open 24 hours. I clutch my gun and open the door, half expecting to be instantly dragged through the pavement and directly to hell, but it's clear. Cautiously, I crouch down, verify that there was, in fact, no one, no monster, underneath the car. I'm fairly certain now that we are finally safe. We're all shaking, so I took the last of the weed that we were saving for some other time, and I passed it around. I also let the dogs out to check over them as well. I could tell they've had a long night too. And I noticed that Nebraska is limping. Kind of bad, actually. So getting him medical attention is bumped up on our priority list. I asked the guy working the gas station, and he says that there is an emergency animal hospital just a couple towns over, that deals mostly with cattle, but could take a look at him. We hit McDonald's before getting back on the highway, and of course, just to top everything off that we have been through, their ice cream machine was broken. Anyway, the vet stitches Nebraska up, gives him some painkillers and antibiotics, but his leg is broken, and we get told that we'd be better off getting him taken care of at our actual vet. 
We finally make it home. The sun is up. We don't even bother trying to sleep. We wait a couple hours for our local vet to open up. She puts his leg in a cast, but also tells us that he's now blind in his right eye. And that's pretty much the end of this. Sorry it's a little anticlimactic, but it's all true. So that was pretty crazy, wasn't it? If you liked the video, then be sure to like and subscribe, and hit the notification bell and all that good stuff. And if I had to take a wild shot in the dark as to where this took place, it mentioned the bay, and it mentioned this secluded beach, so I'd have to guess Sandy Cove, or somewhere maybe around the Bay of Fundy, but I could be wrong. That's just a shot in the dark. But I hope you did enjoy the video, and I hope you enjoyed this crazy encounter from Nova Scotia. If you have a story of your own, I have an email in the description below that you can send it to if you'd like to. Down there as well is a PayPal and a Patreon if you would like to support the channel that way. And of course, super thanks here on YouTube. And with that, I thank you for pulling up a stump with me. Remember to follow the three H's of the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.